Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the program, Marissa Lopez on Picturing Mexican America, a Digital Visual Networked History of the Future. Uh, my name is Rose Nopka, and I'm a librarian archivist in the Digitization and Special Collections Department at Central Library. Our presenter today, Marissa Lopez, is Professor of English and Chicana, Chicano Studies at UCLA, researching Chicanx literature from the 19th century to the present with an emphasis on 19th century Mexican California. She has written two books, Chicano Nations about nationalism and Chicanx literature from the early 1800s to post 9-11, Racial Eminence explores uses of the body and affect in Chicanx cultural production. Marissa recently completed a year-long residency at the Los Angeles Public Library as a Scholars and Society Fellow with the ACLS, where she worked to collaboratively develop a mobile app, Picturing Mexican America, that uses geodata to display images and information on Mexican California relevant to a user's location. During her residency, Marissa did research in subject departments at Central Library and in rare books. The Picturing Mexican America project is an exciting collaboration that will make historical research accessible to a wide range of users. Um, so we're gonna begin our program. Um, please feel free to type in questions um, for the Q&A during the presentation. We'll have time for a discussion at the end of the program. And now I would like to welcome Marissa. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm here to talk about picturing Mexican America, and I am going to go ahead and share some slides with you all. Um, it's gonna happen. <laughs> here we go. I am new to this format, so thank you for bearing with me. So I'm here to talk with you about this, picturing Mexican America, which is a cluster of uh, digital public humanities projects that I designed and managed. The Los Angeles Public Library was an important early supporter and I consider them an ongoing partner. So today I'm gonna explain the history of the project and uh, how I came to work with the LAPL and I'll also discuss some PMA initiatives, how they draw on LAPL resources, sketch out our future plans in broad strokes and let you know how to follow us and stay informed. And along the way, you'll get to see some of the very, very cool material that I found in LAPL's collections. By way of introduction though, I am going to tell you a story about Los Angeles's first hotel. The Bella Union, and this is an image from uh, LAPL. It began life as 18, in 1835 as a store, which became in 1846 Pio Pico's offices when he was the last Mexican governor of California before it became part of the United States. The building was then headquarters for the US forces in Los Angeles during the Mexican-American War. And this map is actually from the National Archives. And eventually in 1849, the building opened as the Bell Union, the best and only hotel in Los Angeles where people went to have a good old fashioned Wild West time. And these images are both from the Los Angeles Public Library. Remembering the Bell Union, Horace Bell writes of his 1852 arrival in Los Angeles. I'll read you a little bit from his memoir. The house was a one story flat roof adobe with a corral in the rear extending to Los Angeles Street with the usual great Spanish portal near which stood a little frame house, one room above and one room below. The lower room had the sign Imprenta over the door uh, fronting Los Angeles Street, which meant that the star was published therein. The room upstairs was used as a dormitory for the printers and editors. So Bell goes on to talk about, obviously he's talking about a slightly different structure than the one you're seeing in the image. And he goes on to talk about how the rooms were tiny and had dirt floors that got muddy when it rained because the roof leaked, which sounds really great, right? Uh, but the hotel bar apparently more than made up for the muddy floors. And so this, uh, image that you're seeing here, the, the drawing of the um, men gambling, that's um, actually from the Bancroft Library in, in Northern California, but it does evoke the diversity of the crowd that Bell describes as um, inhabiting the, the bar at the Bell Union. So I'm gonna read you a little bit more from Horace Bell. He says, the bar was well supplied. 
So said the advertisement. It was well patronized. So says this truthful historian. In one corner behind the bar stood a double-barreled shotgun, while lying within convenient reach could be seen a couple of colts of the old army pattern, carrying half-ounce balls and commonly called batteries. The bar was evidently not to be taken by surprise. The bar was well patronized, so reiterates this pious chronicler, and the patrons who came and went from the Bell Union Bar during that time were the most bandit, cutthroat-looking set that the writer had ever set his youthful eyes upon. Some were dressed in the gorgeous attire of the country, some half ranchero, half minor. Others were dressed in the modern style. All, however, had slung to their rear the never failing pair of colts, generally with the accompaniment of the bowie knife. So that gives you a little bit of a taste of what Los Angeles was like in the 1850s. And out of all that chaos comes the star, which was uh, the city's, is the city's oldest paper of record. And LAPL does have some original copies of the Star that are available in the history department at the Central Branch. The Star ran from 1851 to 1879. And in 1855, a yearly subscription would cost you $5 payable in cash, corn, wheat, flour, wood, butter, or eggs. And the Star had a Spanish language section and that's what you're looking at here, La Estrella. And one of its first editors was a man named Francisco Ramirez, and he was hired in 1851 as a compositor when he was only 14, and he rose very quickly to become editor of La Estrella in 1854 when he was just 17. And he left in 1855 to found his own Spanish language newspaper, El Clamor Público. So the history and the architecture of this hotel was puro mexicano. So totally Mexican. It was a really important place where some of the first Mexican-American writing was produced, where Mexican Californian leaders uh, hashed out strategies for combating Anglo-US aggression, and where all kinds of people came to socialize. So what happened to the Bell Union? Today, it's Fletcher Bowman Square, uh, across from the Spring Street Courthouse. So the building may be gone, but some of the Bella Union's history is preserved in two plaques marking two different historical landmarks. The first announces the spot as California Registered Historical Landmark number 656, the site of the Bella Union, and so that's what you're seeing on the left, site of the Bella Union Hotel, where the first Overland Mail coach arrived in 1858. So no mention there of Pico, Spanish architecture, Mexican society, no mention either of the imprenta, but that's because right next to this plaque on the left, you'll find the one on the right, uh, the one for landmark number 789, which commemorates the star, but not La Estrella, definitely not El Clamor Público or Francisco Ramirez. So these two plaques and the story of the Bella Union are a really perfect example of something entirely unsurprising, which is that commemorating history in California especially in Los Angeles, has largely meant celebrating Anglo-Americans and deliberately ignoring, even erasing Mexican-Americans. So the story of California that we still tell, that our kids still learn in school, is, is basically this. So once upon a time, indigenous people lived here. The Spanish arrived, and that was pretty all right, but awkward sometimes, and the priests of the missions weren't always so nice, but they meant well. Uh, and then some history happens. Maybe Mexico gained its independence from Spain or something. Uh, we're not really sure, and we don't really care. Uh, things were kind of messed up for a while, but finally, white people arrived to make everything better. Uh, and there's a lot that we could dig into there. Uh, but the thing that I want to focus on is the thing that's always bothered me about this story uh, is how everyone just glosses over the Mexican period like it never happened. Right? We've got the indigenous, we've got the Spanish and Yankee settlers, but California used to be Mexico. It had Mexican leaders, Mexican dramas, Mexican laws, and every important white guy in early California history was able to become important because he married a Mexican woman and got in good with a Mexican family. The systematic erasure of those stories is a function of white cultural supremacy and it contributes to the overall impact of institutional racism. I'm an English professor, I am not an expert on public health, uh, on poverty or immigration, but I do know about stories 
and their potential to impact people's lives in meaningful ways. And my belief in the power of story and my commitment to telling the long story of Mexican Los Angeles is what drives picturing Mexican America. Really though, picturing Mexican America exists because I am a super huge history nerd. So if there is a historical marker to be read, anytime, anywhere, I will read it. Seriously, it drives my family nuts. But I'm a professor of literature, not history. And I am a lover of old books and dusty archives. A couple of years ago, though, uh, I started to get really interested in visualization and how people conceive of images and how images affect people who view them and the impact of images on social and political life. And that was the seed of picturing Mexican America. So let me set the scene with a very brief intellectual genealogy. Uh, so mostly I started thinking about pictures because I was working on my second book, uh, which came out in August of 2019. And it's about contemporary Chicanx cultural production or contemporary for me anyway. I'm a 19th century person and this book is really about the turn of the 80s, the 1980s into the 90s. Uh, so I have a chapter in this book on conceptual photography and I was doing a lot of research and reading and the history of photography the emergence of visual technologies, what it needs to see. And I started thinking, as I do, about Californios, about 19th century Mexican Californians. I wondered, well, what were they seeing at this time when photography was being invented? What impact did emerging technologies like cameras have on Californios? So for example, I teach this book um, as an object lesson in late 19th century Mexican-American disenfranchisement. And rereading it recently, I noticed that photography and picture making play uh, really important roles in the book. It might actually be working at cross purposes to my teaching. So one of the main characters in the book is named Mercedes and she imagines keeping a memory of a, a cityscape photographed, the author uses the word photographed uh, in her memory and not only does she have a photo of her Anglo boyfriend, but she wants to have that photo enlarged and painted when he leaves on a business trip. So what did it mean for her, for Mercedes, a woman of color, a Mexican woman in 19th century California, she's a character in a book, but what would it have meant for her uh, not just to think in pictures, but to imagine herself taking, making, and altering those pictures? And what, moreover, would it mean for 21st century Latinos to see her command of and presence in a 19th century visual field? So this is the image that really catalyzed my thinking around this question. So this is a picture of Mariano Vallejo's daughters and he was the Mexican military commander of California uh, at the time of the transfer to US rule in 1848. And he was also the most wealthy and powerful man in the state. So I've written a lot about Vallejo and I came across this image while researching in his archive at Mission Sonoma in Northern California. He supervised the building of that mission and uh, he's got a house there and his uh, archive is there and it's maintained by California Parks and Rec. And so when I was researching, I wasn't interested in Vallejo's daughters, but I found the picture so compelling. It's so weird and creepy. And I was delighted when the park ranger on duty let me take a digital copy. And I've had this picture up in my office and I've been looking at it for years. There's so much going on both within and outside this the frame. Who is taking this picture and why? And where are they? And why aren't they facing the camera? And what is it that they imagine, these women imagine the viewer is seeing? Are they showing us something or are they refusing to be seen? So I wrote an article exploring these questions, as you do when you're an English professor. Uh, the title of it might look familiar. It's called Picturing Mexican America. But even after I wrote this article where I was thinking deeply about these questions around visualization, even after I wrote this article, I still felt like my questions weren't resolved. And they're not questions that can be resolved via traditional methods of scholarship. So I was really fortunate that around the same time that I reached this uh, professional crossroads or intellectual crossroads, the American Council of Learned Societies rolled out a brand new program. This is the Scholars and Society Fellowship. And it pulled together 
several different strands that I had been following in my work, especially around career diversity and uh, innovation in doctoral education. So this opportunity catalyzed my thinking as I worked on the application. So over the years, because remember, I'm a super huge history nerd. So over the years, I've encountered several different history apps, tools that uh, allow you to explore the history of a place um, through walking tours or map pop-ups. And I've always thought, gosh, you know what? Somebody should make something like this for California. And, and there's nothing like it for California. Uh, so when I got this fellowship, though, I became that person that's going to make something like this for California. Uh, and the fellowship requires recipients to collaborate with a public-facing institution. And I was delighted when the library agreed to partner with me. So I'm the scholar. LAPL is the society. And with the app that I'm building, I hope to change users' perceptions of place, space, to make clear the consistent presence of Latinx people in the United States. I want this app to make knowledge, knowledge, genuinely public and collaborative using digital media that profoundly alters the definition and boundaries of the public who have access to and who partake in the public humanities. I am most interested in what the public uh, makes of cool archival finds like this. So what is the political potential of circulating a map like this that visualizes the deep Mexican history of the land on which UCLA now sits? So LAPL uh, doesn't hold original maps like this, but rare books at Central does have some very nice mid-century art books that include reproductions and interpretive essays. The California State Archives has the largest collection of maps like this, and they just recently digitized for open access their complete collection in September of 2019. So how, back to this question of, you know, what happens when you circulate a map like this though, uh, how do conversations around access, equity and um, belonging change when we see something like this. So to explore that, the political potential of something like this map, I can't just be interested in a public problem. I have to work with the public to better articulate problems and collaboratively imagine solutions. And that's where the library comes in. There's a lot of cultural institutions in and around Los Angeles, uh, including UCLA, house the kind of material that interests me and I've worked in special collections all over the state of California. So of these, LAPL doesn't have the biggest or the deepest collection, but they're still the my ideal collaborator on this on this project. And, and the collection that LAPL does have is pretty solid. Um, the library is my ideal collaborator. So why? Well as you know, uh, as library fans, you know that the LAPL system holds over 6 million volumes and with over 18 million residents in the greater Los Angeles area, the library serves the largest population of any publicly funded library system in the United States. In 2015, LAPL was awarded the National Medal for Museum and Library Service. This is the nation's highest honor given to museums and libraries for service to the community. So before COVID, I was working at the central branch of LAPL in the Goodhue building, which in addition to housing all the system's rare and photographic material is a designated Los Angeles Cultural Historical Monument and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. And LAPL has both an extensive photographic archive as well as a robust and diverse slate of public programs their community reach was a really large part of what attracted me to the library as a partner on this project, but that piece is on hold for now, obviously. Um, I had been researching at the library for around six months before COVID shut everything down. And in that time, I learned so, so much from librarians and staff. I spent my first couple of months having lots of lunches and coffee and conversations and getting to know people who worked in all different capacities. And these conversations helped me get a handle on the scope of the library's work. It helped clarify the ways in which picturing Mexican America could align with and support the library's mission to serve the people of LA. And all the people that I met had lots of really interesting ideas about what an app like I was imagining might look like and what it might do. So two of these conversations were watershed moments for me 
first in rare books with Sochi Oliva, who's the former department head, and then with Rose Naka, uh, who introduced me this morning, who, as she said of herself, and I will repeat, she's a library and archivist in digitization and special collections at Central. And she has kindly invited me to speak here today. I did not understand how much archival material LAP held LAPL held before I began this project, but Rose has been an amazing guide, uh, helping me navigate holdings and calling things to my attention that haven't even been cataloged. It has been amazing to get to see things like this. Uh, not all of this material that I'm finding in rare books is immediately useful for the app or for social media, because that stuff really has to be visually rich. Uh, not textually rich, but I will do something with documents like these. I, in my gut, I know that this material is important. I mean, obviously it's important, it's important in and of itself. Uh, but I mean, for me, this, this stuff is important for what I want to do. I'm going to make use of it. I'm just not entirely sure how yet. Uh, but until then, it's such a gift uh, to be able to read and handle it. And the energy of rare book staff and librarians is, is pretty galvanizing. Unlike some archives, uh, which shall remain nameless, but unlike some archives, they really want people to see and use this material. So I am really looking forward to collaborating with rare books on some post-COVID K through 12 educational programming. I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, the other pivotal meeting that I had was with Edwin Rodarte, who is the Senior Librarian for Emerging Technologies and Collections. His insights were crucial and connected me, he connected me with volunteers from Hack for LA, which is a group of civic-minded tech professionals looking to donate their talents uh, in their free time to projects like mine that benefit the public good. So he introduced me to Lexi Quint and Tim Marine, who have been really They've been the key factors in moving Picturing Mexican America from kind of a vague idea to a back-end ready design prototype. So I started work at the library with some idea of what I was doing. So last academic year, uh, I held a small grant from UCLA. So 1819 so academic year, I had a small grant from UCLA that funded um, a graduate tech consultant who worked with me to refine my thinking around the project. And also they helped me design this course, Digital Humanities 199. It's a topic-based research seminar for DH minors. And I taught this in spring 2019. I led a team of undergraduate researchers who built the core database for the app uh, by adding materials from special collections at UCLA. They added metadata and geolocation information. And I trained them in how to work with and, and think about archival material. And for the class, they completed a series of small assignments, including writing blog posts for my website uh, about individual items and also assessing um, entire collections. So in the post-COVID future, I really want to be able to bring UCLA students to the library to do something similar. In 2019, my students also um, built mock-ups of that. Uh, they all share all the mockups that my students built share similar features. They have a map platform, gamification, and, and a way to interface with social media. So I had a vision of, in my mind, uh, going into my time at the library, I had a vision in my mind of what it could look like, what this app could look like. But Lexi and Tim helped me take that to the next level. In January of 2020, they ran a visioning workshop with me at UCLA. Rose and Neil Stokes, who are, both of them are running this program this morning, uh, they were there at my visioning session, as was Edwin. We also had UCLA librarians, some of the graduate student researchers that I had hired to work on the project. My teenage son and some of his friends were there, uh, as well as various other community stakeholders. We gathered about 20 people on a Saturday morning to brainstorm. And also at this session were design students from General Assembly, which is a, an organization that offers training and career development to design professionals in Los Angeles. And I had applied and I was accepted to be one of the pro bono, like real world design projects uh, for one of their classes. So from that session that we had in January, our design students built this. 
prototype, uh, which is now um, what we're designing the back end to. So you can see an image there on the right, and then there's the, on the left, you're just watching a little video of the click through of the app. So this is what it's gonna look like one day. Uh, this work takes a really long time. So one of the many things that I'm learning, uh, taking on this project, I've learned uh, that building an app takes a long time, especially when that work is powered by volunteers. I had hoped to have a beta version launched this calendar year, um, but now I'm hoping that we'll have something by the end of January. And as this has been chugging along, though my work on the app, has spawned lots of different branches. So that where I used to just say, I'm building an app. Now I describe picturing Mexican America as I did at the beginning of this talk as a cluster of digital projects. So since I started working on PMA and bringing more people onto my team, I've been most uh, surprised and delighted by the way the project has grown and the new things that people have pushed me to explore. Take Instagram, for example. All of the millennials on my team insisted on an Instagram feed. And at first I was doubtful because I didn't really understand the platform, but I took a leap of faith and that running this Instagram feed has been really generative for me. It's connected me to lots of like-minded people and organizations uh, in and around Los Angeles and, and has done a lot to elevate the visibility of our efforts. So you can find Picturing Mexican America now on Instagram, on Twitter, Facebook, and on YouTube, uh, but we're most active on Instagram. And if you're on Instagram, you should definitely follow us there to keep up with us and to see some of the very cool material, some of which you've seen in this presentation, material that will one day be in our app. And on Instagram, We've been thinking about that uh, as, as a platform for circulating archival material, to, a way to free archival material from wherever it's being ignored, and to get as many eyes on it as we can in order to start conversations. And when I say our, our mission is to do this, I mean the researchers and the writers, who are mostly students that I have working with me. So with our posts, we are trying to connect visions of the past to things that are happening today. And we're doing this because our long game is to change how people perceive the physical environment of Los Angeles, we want to intervene in how people think about who has a right to be here, to be in this territory that we now know as the United States, but which used to be Mexico. And before that was Tovangar. So we are trying to change the conversation about belonging and to make some new stories possible. So for example, here's a post uh, that we did back in May. This is an image from LAPL. And the text of the post reads, it's easy to forget that there's a presidential campaign going on right now. Again, this was in May. Uh, Even though we're all aware that the approaching contest will be a momentous one, but did you know that in 1872, Los Angeles experienced a mayoral contest that was arguably even more consequential? Join us at 1230 uh, Friday, May 29th to learn more as we talk with historian David Roof about that contest, which he discusses in his book, Before L.A. In Before L.A., David talks about James Toberman's defeat of incumbent Cristobal Aguilar to become, in 1872, Los Angeles' 12th mayor. Toberman's victory marked the end of shared politics in LA and ushered in what David describes as an exclusivist racial vision that effectively erased Mexican Americans from the city's political and historical landscape. It also cut Mexican Americans off from emerging civic infrastructure in ways that brought to life LA's current divisions of race and class. In other words, we can trace our understanding of race, space, and place in Los Angeles all the way back to the 1872 mayoral election. We'll talk about all that and more this Friday. So that happened in May, but you can find that conversation uh, with Professor Torres Roof on our YouTube channel. It's there. Another post in May featured um, an image you already saw. This is kind of the Rainbow Coalition of Early LA Gamblers. This is kind of a diverse group of, we see a Mexican man standing at the table. We see an Anglo dealing the cards. We see a Chinese man next to a Mexican man. So. I showed this to you earlier to convey a sense of the diversity of people who are gathering in LA. Uh, so you already saw this image, but for the post, we 
added other images, and these other two are from LAPL collections. I had mentioned that that drawing is from the Bancroft in Northern California. And we connected all of this to COVID-inspired instances of anti-Chinese sentiment. And the post text reads, anti-Chinese violence has a long history in the United States and was particularly bad in 19th century LA. Now more than ever, when our Asian friends are afraid to leave the house for fear of getting yelled at, spat on, or worse, we would do well to remember where that kind of nonsense might get us. As it is today, 19th century LA was incredibly cosmopolitan. The drawing above, made around 1850 by an anonymous artist, is from UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library. In it, a gambler deals to Chinese, Mexican, and Spanish players from different classes. Mexican and Chinese immigrants lived, worked, and played together. They also were racialized, were subject to racialized violence. But the Chinese really did have it worse. And we don't want to romanticize their cross-racial solidarity. Sure, late 19th century LA was an increasingly dangerous place for Mexicans, but nothing ever happened to them that was as bad as what happened in LA's Chinatown in 1871. That October, a mob of Angelinos descended on Chinatown with guns, knives, and ropes. They hauled residents out and hung them from improvised gallows. The mob looted homes and businesses and lynched 19 Chinese immigrants. The photograph above from LA Public Library shows victims' bodies piled near the LA jailhouse. A plaque at 419 North Los Angeles Street commemorates the event in DTLA. It says that, quote, some policemen and citizens tried to help, quote, but memoirist Horace Bell disputes that kind of revisionism. Quote, the police force of the city furnished the leaders of the mob, he writes in reminiscences of a rager. Quote, the chief of police of Los Angeles stationed his policemen and the deputies he had mustered in for the occasion at all strategic points with orders to shoot to death any Chinese that might stick a head out or attempt to escape from the besieged buildings. So this wasn't the first or the last act of anti-Chinese violence in the city, but it was definitely one of the worst. In these dark times, let's remember that history and make sure it doesn't happen again. So again, we're trying to connect visions of the past to things that are happening today in 2020. And our focus is on Mexican Los Angeles, uh, but we're also invested in illuminating how diverse Los Angeles has always been uh, and emphasizing how important cross-racial solidarity and collaboration is in our various struggles for social justice. That diversity and solidarity, the importance of that was definitely on display this summer across the country, uh, but it's also the focus of the next major collaboration that I'll be working on in 2021 with 826 LA, which is an organization that some of you may be familiar with. So 826 LA uh, is the beneficiary of the $15,000 in post-fellowship programming funds that um, my a scholars and Society Fellowship comes with. So I'm gonna be spending the bulk of that here with A26LA. This is a local chapter of a national nonprofit organization, which is dedicated to helping students ages six to 18. So K through 12 students with their creative and expository writing skills. And also they help teachers inspire their students to write. So they are gonna be working with me to design a series of K through 12 programs offered virtually in the winter, but hopefully in person by summer. Uh, and these are gonna be programs built around some of the archival material that I'm pulling from the library. So the plan is that after a year of working with them, I'll be able to replicate their workshops at branch libraries using undergraduate students from UCLA as instructors. So that's my long game at any rate. Um, 2020 has taught us many things, one of which is that the universe always laughs at your plans. So that's my long game and we will see what happens in 2021. And A26LA made clear in our early conversations that they were on board with PMA generally, but they wanted any jointly developed programs to have space for thinking about Los Angeles's broad diversity. And we will do that. Uh, but we will also always keep in mind that before LA was anything, it was Tovankar which I mentioned earlier. And at PMA, we recognize the Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of Tovangar, and that's the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. But we are also grappling with the fact that uh, this space once was, it still is, and it will always be 
Mexican who are finding ways to help people understand that and to experience Los Angeles's Mexican past, present, and future. And we're trying to do that in fun, potentially transformative ways. And so one potentially transformative project of ours that you can explore on your own, even without Instagram, is this. We uh, teamed up with the Los Angeles Explorers Club to produce a series of self-guided bike tours. Uh, the first of these is called Daily Life in Early Los Angeles. And it, Los Angeles in the mid 19th century, it was, as John McFargo describes it in Eternity Street, and I'm quoting him, a violent place in a violent time. Nevertheless, people still managed to have fun here. So what did early Angelinos do to entertain themselves? And what do entertainment, popular culture, and daily life in the 19th century reveal about the racial and ethnic tensions in Los Angeles in 2020? Our ride explores that very question and it uncovers the hidden histories of some DTLA landmarks. No bike, no problem. Uh, a lot of this ride can be walked and you can follow all of it on Google Maps using Street View. Uh, you can download a PDF and uh, of the route at the link on the slide, and you can also just Google it, and you can find audio by searching for Picturing Mexican America on SoundCloud and Spotify. It's on both of those platforms. We just released our second ride, which is all about Arcadia Bandini, and that ride focuses on Santa Monica and the West Side. So you can follow us on Instagram or uh, sign up at our website uh, to receive updates at picturingmexicanamerica.com. So by way of closing, bringing all, all of these balls that I have in the air, smushing them into one, I wanna share one of the stories from our daily life ride that's super interesting, but also speaks to the racial conflicts that consumed Los Angeles and really the entire country this summer. And this is a story about horses. So Andres Pico and Jose Sepulveda were elite Mexican Californians who moved in the same social circles, even though they weren't especially fond of each other. So Pico, Sepulveda, elite Californians, also the names of some very important streets in contemporary Los Angeles. But back to the 19th century, these frenemies loved to race their horses. But unfortunately for Sepulveda, Pico Stallion Sarco always came out on top. Sepulveda really needed a win. So at the end of 1851, he imported Black Swan, a very expensive Australian steed who was as famous in her home country as Sarco was in California. But the horse was frail from the ocean crossing when she arrived in San Francisco late that year. And people wondered if she could really stand a chance against Pico Stallion, but Sepulveda believed, he believed in his mare and he hatched a plan. He made sure that Pico and a crowd were present when Black Swan arrives in California, in, in Los Angeles. And Californios favored Spanish bred horses and Sepulveda hoped that his mare's heritage, she's Australian, along with her frail state would fool Pico into thinking a gamble between Black Swan and his horse was an easy win and that worked. A lot of people staked a lot of money on Sarco. And in total, the bets added up to around $50,000 in cash and a whole lot of horses, heifers, and sheep. So the two horses met on March 20th, 1852. And Sepulveda had been training Black Swan in secret and his efforts paid off. So there's a huge crowd that was gathered in front of the Bell Union. And they were shocked when Black Swan swiftly defeated Sarko in 19 minutes and 20 seconds. Finally, a win over Pico. It wasn't just the win though that freaked everybody out. The jockey who rode Black Swan to victory was black. And this never before seen phenomenon, a black jockey was so noteworthy that reports of the race describe how the crowd gasped in shock when they saw him, but Nobody thought to record his name. His identity has been lost to history and we only know that he was black. And what is striking about this story uh, to me is how my recovery and recirculation of, of the black swan victory, that recovery just leads to another erasure. It uncovers another elision absence. 
the more we see, the more we're aware of not seeing. So who was this black man and what must it have meant for him to achieve this great victory under the thumb of a Mexican owner? A colleague of mine uh, at UCLA, Fred Daguerre, uh, he's a very well-known British Guyanese writer. He was so struck by this story when he did our tour uh, that he wrote a poem for the unnamed black jockey. And when I read that poem, I was moved in ways that I, I can't fully describe. And I convinced Fred to do, to record a reading followed by a conversation between him and I, uh, between the two of us, where we talked about the poem and how the unnamed Jackie helps us unpack all of the rage and complexity of our current historical moment. And you can find that conversation also on our YouTube channel. And I encourage you to watch it. Uh, for me, it was so energizing to get to think with another person in a different way about how and why stories are important, how they empower, how they build bridges, um, foster solidarity, and inspire people to create. The Los Angeles Public Library is the beating heart of the city that makes this work, the kind of work that I'm doing, possible. And back before COVID, when I got to physically be in the library, I was always so ridiculously happy walking up from the metro station to the Goodhue building. And walking into the building fills me with joy and hope. And I, I know that we will all get to experience that, that feeling again soon. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to partner with LAPL on this project aimed at circulating that joy and hope beyond the library's walls inspiring people to create a better tomorrow. So that's the end of my slides. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'll toss things back to Rose. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marissa. That was such a great talk. And I'm really excited about all the things we can follow up with. And um, I'm looking forward to your collaboration with um, the 26 LA. That's so exciting. Yeah, I I hope we can work together again. <laughs> One day, be in the yeah. same room together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, so we did have a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Um, and um, they're about the plaques that you mentioned um, that are in um, Fletcher Bowen Square. Um, the plaques about the Bella Union Hotel and also about the Chinese massacre. Um, do you have an idea of when they were put up? Ooh, the years that they were established, I don't. There, are, I know that there are, there are early 20th century plaques um, that the process of putting up the plaques began in the early 20th century with an organization called the Native Daughters of the Golden West, who were really active in the 20s and 30s. And they're still a group today. I think now they're called the Native Daughters and Sons of the Golden West. Um, so, and they were the group that um, started the placard placing, uh, but I do not, off the top of my head, know the exact years that those those plaques in particular were placed, but that is a great question. It's interesting. Um, so this one's a little more general. Um, it's a question I had. Um, what are some of the things that surprised you when you were working on the Picturing Mexican America project? I mean, everything, <laughs> like there's lots of ways to answer that uh, question. There's like little interesting tidbits that I, I learned. Like I, I did not totally understand the deep history of North-South um, tensions, the, the, the divisions, the North-South California divide. And I, I, did not understand that it goes all the way back <laughs> to the 1830s, probably even a little bit before that, but in the 1830s and 1835 is when um, the California representative to the Mexican Congress, who was a non-voting member, uh, convinced the Mexican government to make, to promote Los Angeles from a city, from a Pueblo to a city. And that doing that then laid the groundwork for the, capital in Mexico City to declare Los Angeles the capital of Alta California, which like set off a whole firestorm of, of activity. But that was something that uh, uh, I think it was something that you showed me, Rose, in in uh, special collections um, 
uncovered for me, right? The LAPL, and we saw that um, on the slide has a, a kind of art reprint of the charter, the kind of the law declaring Los Angeles is, is now a city and, and, and in addition is now the capital. Uh, and so discovering that led me to really do the research on that. And I think it's from mm -hmm. that moment, from that declaration in 1835 that we can trace the genealogy of uh, Northern and Southern California aggressions. And that was really interesting. It was, I honestly, I did not understand, like I said in the talk, how much stuff you guys have. And then when you told me like, oh yeah, and we've got a ton of stuff that like, nobody even knows it's here. I'm trying to catalog it now. Like that was amazing to me. Uh, and that's just, I think maybe indicative of like the limits of my own imagination or understanding of, of how vital an institution the library really was. I was already on team library. I love libraries and I think that's some things, but you know, my understanding of the scope really exploded. Um, and I guess I, I was also surprised. I knew that as an institution, the library would be, is open to um, non-academic researchers to just, you know, we're here for you, the city, like, come look at our stuff. But I was really excited and surprised that um, you guys were amenable to, uh, you would entertain the possibility of having K through 12 students at least come, <laughs> come and, and handle material. Because, you know, UCLA is great too. And, you know, we're, you see, we're for the people, by the people, of the people. Anybody can come in as long as you're 18 and have a valid form of ID. Right? UCLA would never let me bring fourth graders into special collections. <laughs> so. well, yeah, that's one of the things I think we're, as a team, we're most proud of is being able to work with um, grade school kids, high school kids. Um, we've had a few school groups in, and yeah. Yeah, it's really rewarding. I think, you know, anybody who's read Susan Orlean's The Library Book would know, just kind of to extend this about being open to public school, school kids, anybody who's read that book would know, or who spent a lot of time at the library would know, like, how open to the city the library building itself is, right, and how there's all kinds of people who are using the resources in the library in all, all kinds of different ways. And I think that was, for me, not, it was surprising to have the opportunity to think about uh, like what knowledge means <laughs> and knowledge production and access to knowledge could being in this space where it's like all walks of life, literally, and that's a correct use of literally, but literally all walks of life are moving through the space of the library at any given moment on any given day. And they're all engaged in some kind of knowledge production. I mean, I, I, yeah, I often feel like I should have just gone to library school, but I, I guess all librarians understand this. I just spent a lot of time in academic libraries, and so it was really helpful for me in kind of doing that deep, like, existential thinking about the project to be able to be in that space, which one day I hope to be in again. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to say it was, it was really great to work with you, especially over a period of time. And um, I think you helped us to understand our, our materials more, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> and we love to yeah. like show the decree all yeah. the time on our tours, and yeah, it's great to know more more about it and about the rivalry so, between Northern and Southern California. Time. So cool. Um. So um, you talked a little bit about this about your plans beyond this project, but um. um uh, do you have any future plans that this, you know, kind of remember <laughs> ring in the back of your mind? Yeah. Um, you know, this, I, I said in the talk that the Scholars and Society opportunity came uh, at a really opportune time for me because I had been thinking for a while, even after I published my first book and I got tenure at UCLA, I just been thinking uh, sort of open-ended question, like what, what does it mean to be a professor? Like, what what is the the nature of the work that I'm doing here? And uh, you know, a lot of the models that I have for that, you know, kind of senior scholars really established in their careers. I, it's I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do that. <laughs> like, be a venerable person churning out book after book after book. I could do that, uh, but I just was really looking for ways 
to think differently about what it meant to be a professor and even to engage the public humanities because there's a way that we have in academia of talking about the public humanities, which basically means like, I'm a professor and now I'm going to go out in the public and be a professor, which uh, it doesn't always go over well, but also I, that was not what I was interested in either. I, I wanted to be a professor in a different way. And I think I'm still on the path <laughs> to figuring out what exactly that means. Uh, so, which is a roundabout way of saying, I'm open and alive to the possibilities uh, that this project is opening up before me. Like I said in the talk, you know, I've been connected with different kinds of cultural workers, like the Los Angeles Explorers Club, they reached out to us over Instagram and it was their idea to do this. Uh, and it seemed fun and interesting to me. And then it, it was a really generative intellectual project. Uh, so I do have some ideas of, of things that I want to do. I have been, you know, one of the research questions that I articulated in the grant application and the, the scholars and society application was that, and a version of this came out in the talk, you know, what is the political potential of circulating this material? Both, you know, how, how what are the different ways that we can move it through the world and, and what happens when people see Latinx people in, in all of the places when people, Latinos and non-Latinos alike, like what happens when you like really see how this space was Mexican? And I don't know the answer to that question. I A, don't know the answer to that question. I'm not entirely sure how to gather data to answer that question. So I'm hoping the Instagram feed generates a lot of comments uh, and conversations in the comment thread. So that's one place that I want to look to, to try to think about answering this question. But then I'm also really excited about the A26 LA workshops. And I'm really interested in seeing what emerges from the material that students create from student writing. Uh, I, I think that, that their creative process and products, I, I think will be a window onto uh, a more concrete answer about the political potential uh, of this material. I mean, what happens when you get somebody, you know, right on the cusp of, you know, like 10, 11, 12, you know, they're like transitioning into late kiddom and early adulthood. I mean, you, you give them this information and really make them see and understand I, I, that can be a very powerful thing. I've seen it be a powerful thing for college students, just taking college students into special collections, uh, just especially first generation underrepresented students. And they bring them into this kind of rarefied space and show them like, look, you're here. That sort of has like baggage in its own right. It's like, what is thinking about like archives and collecting, but still like it, it can be transformative. Uh, so I digress a little bit, but yeah, I, I do want to do some writing and like kind of more traditional academic thinking and I'll probably write an article about that kind of using student material as a primary source. Uh, and we're going to do some more bike rides. I, I don't really know. I, I like being at this stage of my career where, you know, I just published my second book. I was promoted to full and with that comes a, a kind of freedom to kind of experiment and, and think think differently. So I'm excited to do that. So I have some things in the pipeline, but uh, but I'm also open to you know, being being swayed to a new fork in the path. Uh, I just saw the, the question come up in the chat about the uh, hair. <laughs> I have like an insane amount of hair, I know. Uh, I, and my sense is that that's typical. Uh, there are not, I have not seen another image like that anywhere, just the from the back. Um, but, you know, there's there's plenty of um, pictures of women of that period with their hair down and thinking of like kind of Julia Cameron's work in, in, in England, um, it's like probably the most visible and easily accessible example. So women had a lot of hair. <laughs> Which is to me, everything, because I mean, my hair just couldn't grow that long. And I so, don't know why i mean by by all accounts were like much better fed and and nourished than women in the 19th century were so i don't know why they were there and how long it, I can't. Um, I it kind of touched on our time too like you're saying like some of these things touch on the present because we can't i mean yeah it's very easily I mean, those were some hard women that's another way of thinking about it like you know one 
thing when you kind of dig into and, and read these accounts. This is something that comes up that I teach a lot. Like so much of the material that we have is from a male perspective. There's very little from women's points of view. But those rare accounts, you, you see women talking about life and and um, just kind of like the embodied experience of living in these really different ways and talking about childbirth and all kinds of things and that that make you think, you know, I am a human that has given birth to two people. And I just can't imagine doing that. Like these women were giving birth 10, 12, 15 times. And you know, some of these kids were living, and most of them were dying. And, you know, they those women who made it to adulthood and, and had all those babies and like to pick things up again after all the earthquakes. And I mean, just, they were Amazons. Like, of course, of course they could grow their hair that long. <laughs> um, I just thought I'd toss out one last question. Um, so we're, we're closing in on an hour. Um, so since we've been relying more on digital collections um, during the pandemic, um, I was wondering if you could name a few that were useful in your research. Um, you brought up TESSA, um, which is the digital collections of the Los Angeles Public Library in your talk. There, but there's many more. Yes. Uh, so the... Well, the granddaddy of them all is the Digital Public Library of America, which some of your viewers might be familiar with. It's dp.la, so you can just search for that. And that is an initiative. I think the Smithsonian is a, a, a driving partner on that um, initiative to do something similar to what Calisphere does in the state of California. So I'll get to Calisphere in a second, but Digital Public Library partners with digital repositories around the country and, and those repositories make their material available through the DPLA interface. Uh, so it's, it's massive and it is amazing, amazing. Uh, and I, I do use DPLA in, in my research and for this project and, and more, I like to focus on Calisphere uh, because my part of my goal and it will be my goal uh, ongoing is, is to highlight material in, in LAPL and UCLA collections, um, material that, that is uh, accessible and open to the public. Uh, so Calisphere is like DPLA, but for digital repositories in California. So those, those are the two that I use the most. Um, and Calisphere draws from Tessa is, is a big contributing um, institution. There's always tons of LAPL stuff, but Tessa, the Huntington, USC, uh, and, and those are the, the, the big collections that come up. But Calisphere, calisphere.org, that's, that's a, an easy way to access a, a bunch of different collections at once. The other, so that's all um, mostly visual material, uh, but the other collection that's accessible uh, to everyone is the California Digital Newspaper Collection, the CDNC, and that mm -hmm. project out of UC Riverside that is like, this is like mind-blowingly awesome. Uh, they have digitized every newspaper in the state of California, like an almost entire runs of every newspaper going back as far as some of the first editions of the star. Uh, and it's just phenomenal. It's such an incredible resource and you can search and it's all scanned with OCR recognition. So, which means um, uh, optimal character recognition. So it, it picks up on words and words, even in things like ads, uh, and so it's amazing. You know, like you can go there and you can search sewing machines, show me stuff on sewing machines in California newspapers between 1880 and 1883. And you just get stuff. Uh, so, so DPLA, Calisphere, and the CDNC have been the, the three big collections. And, you know, since everyone is spending a lot of time at home, if you too are a, a lover of history, there's uh, a lot to satisfy your curiosity and, and interest you in those three. That's so great, thank you. Sure. Um, so is there anything that you'd like to add to conclude the program? <laughs> Just reiterate what I said in, in the close of my talk, that it has been such a wonderful experience to be able to work with the library. I am, I, 
am sad, <laughs> like have a physical experience of sadness and not being able to be in that space. And I, I look forward to, to being there again. But I, I said before, I was already on team library, but this project has really helped me appreciate the library even more, which I didn't think was possible to appreciate it as both a, a repository and engine of knowledge in the community. And I'm just excited and honored to get to be a part of that mission. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the program. And also, um, you know, we really loved working with you. Ditto. <laughs> Look forward to more in the future. Me too. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Marissa. Bye, Rose. Bye.